it's time to go into emergency mode or our chance of reaching net zero will itself be zero. We are in the fight of our lives. Never give up, never retreat, keep pushing forward. That was United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres encouraging young people and everyone concerned about our planet to keep up the fight against climate change. After two weeks of tough negotiations, the 26th UN Climate Conference has come to an end. Member states reached an agreement that the Secretary General called an important step, but not enough. So what's in the text? Let's break it down, starting with emission cuts. Countries agreed current plans are not enough to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and pledge new actions to reach the goal. On coal, the, in the intention was to completely phase it out, but states agreed to phase it down. Countries also agreed to double the proportion of climate finance going to adaptation and to do more to reach the goal of $100 billion for developing nations to deal with the climate crisis. But what does it all mean for our economies, our lives, our future? To explain all these, we have with us Martina Donlon, who leads climate communications at the UN. Martina, thank you so much for being here. From all the initiatives, all the agreements that were announced, can you pick three that are the most impactful? Yes, hello, and thanks for having me. Um, as you said, and as the Secretary General has said, the final text is a compromise and it's not enough, especially for small island states and other vulnerable countries, but it does provide some positive steps forward. One of them is that countries agreed to accelerate action during this decade, this decisive decade when global emissions must be cut in half to reach the temperature goal of uh, 1.5 degrees. And the Glasgow Agreement actually calls on countries to present stronger national action plans next year instead of the original timeline, which was 2025. Um, also, as you mentioned, the pact calls for a phase down of coal and a phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, two key issues that have never been explicitly mentioned in a decision uh, at climate talks before, despite coal, oil and gas, of course, being the key drivers of global warming. So Glasgow did signal an accelerated shift away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. That would be my first point. The second point I'd like to mention is that the Glasgow Pact uh, calls for doubling of finance to support developing countries in adapting to the impacts of climate change. This won't provide all the funding that poorer countries need, but the fact that developed countries agreed to double their collective funds for adaptation is a major improvement. The Secretary General has pushed really hard for increased financing to protect lives, to protect livelihoods, um, and this will especially benefit least developed countries um, and small islands. And my third point would be uh, that there were a host of other deals and announcements, uh, such as on methane, on coal, on forests, on transport, that could all have very positive impacts if they're indeed implemented. But most of these are voluntary commitments and there are no guarantees that governments, investors and corporations will deliver. Will people notice differences in their lives? How is this new pact going to affect us? Well, we probably won't see immediate impacts in our daily lives, but the decisions taken at COP26 will affect decisions by governments on a range of activities and will eventually translate into noticeable differences in people's lives. COP26 also sent a signal to markets that changes are in order and that it's no longer okay to invest in heavily polluting sectors. So these changes will have an impact on our lives and, and probably sooner than we think. For example, the move away from fossil fuels means we will see more electric cars and they will become more affordable and increasingly powered by wind and solar energy. Uh, the phasing out of coal means people in heavily polluted cities will have cleaner air to breathe and fewer respiratory illnesses. Uh, and the increase in finance for protecting lives and livelihoods could mean that small islands can actually put in place early warning systems for floods and storms. 
and small farmers may have access to more reliant and more uh, resilient crops and, and seeds to protect food security. So the decisions at the global level do eventually impact everyone's lives. What is the UN now doing to make the agreement a reality and then to push it forward? The UN has been tirelessly pressing for the full implementation of the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Climate Pact is an agreement that will help implement the Paris Agreement. And the Secretary General will keep pushing for more ambition and for more action. He has actually urged countries to update their national climate plans every year throughout this decade. Um, and he will convene heads of state for a global stock take summit in 2023. He has also announced the establishment of a high level expert group that will propose clear standards to measure and analyze net zero commitments by non-state actors, because not only national governments need to be held accountable, um, also cities, companies and financial institutions that have pledged to reach net zero by 2050. We have to make sure these commitments are credible and verifiable and will actually translate into action. So the work continues. The work uh, for COP27 has already started. And as the Secretary General said, we will never give up. Thank you so much, Martina. Throughout the conference, our UN communication teams were in Glasgow to transport you there. Our colleagues, Laura Quinones, Connor Lennon and Grace Barrett brought you the latest news and flavor of this historic gathering. On our websites, you can read about all the decisions, check the latest newsletter, watch the videos or listen to the podcasts. Before leaving Glasgow, Laura and Connor took a look back on all the action. It's hard to believe we've come to the end of COP26 after two, I've got to say, very long weeks. Very, some very, long, very days. long weeks. But it's been very stimulating. We've met some really interesting people, uh, some experts in the field, delegates, negotiators, all these people who've come here to try and, and, and win a very difficult task, bringing together 197 countries with a common aim. Yeah, and keeping our world to heating more than 1.5 degrees. That's, that's a, a very giant challenge. I remember back at the beginning when we spoke to some of the veterans, the people who come to COPS every year, they all said that the atmosphere this year is very different from previous COPS. Yeah, they were very hopeful. They said it's the first time that uh, a lot of these leaders actually come with all this ambition and all these uh, actual concrete goals. Of course, there, it's never enough. Uh, there's still a lot more to do, but, but this COP was especially um, important and different because of it. Well, for me, the tone was set by two speeches at the beginning. Oh, yes. One of which was from our Secretary General, yes. Antonio Guterres, who, as usual, had some very forceful words to say. The six years since the Paris Climate Agreement have been the six hottest years on record. Our addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. We face a stark choice. Either we stop it or it stops us. And it's time to say enough. And another speech, the one that had the stirring music and the inspiring words was from Sir David Attenborough. Yes, I was in the room and it was really moving to hear him live. You know, I've been hearing him for so many years in these documentaries and TV shows and then just to be there and see this 95 year old man just going at it, it was, it was beautiful. In my lifetime, I've witnessed a terrible decline in yours. You could and should witness a wonderful recovery. That desperate hope, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, excellency, is why the world is looking to you and why you are here. The 95-year-old man who has more energy than people half the, the, than the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> the two of us right now, that's, especially at this stage of proceeding. I felt, Lara, that right from the beginning, it seemed they wanted to start with a bang. And oh, we yes. had a flurry of significant seeming announcements right from the off. Yes. Uh, from day, day two is when the announcement started. And the first one was about forests. On Energy Day, uh, including major coal users, including Poland, Vietnam, and Chile. They agreed to shift away from coal, uh, which is one of the biggest CO2 emissions generator. 
There was also a big call by the private sector. Uh, they show strong engagements with 500 global financial services firms, which agreed to align about 130 trillion, 40% of the world financial assets with the climate goals set in the Paris Agreement. And regarding green transport, over 100 national governments, cities, states, and major businesses signed the Glasgow Declaration of Zero Emission Cars and Vans. And what is this going to do is end the sale of internal combustion engines by 2035 in leading markets and in 2040 worldwide. There was also a big surprise. The yeah. top China negotiator in Kerry came out that day and they announced this agreement, which was actually a joint declaration in which they said they had agreed to take steps on a range of issues, uh, including methane emissions, which was one of the big announcements, uh, transition to clean energy and decarbonization. They also um, commit to keep this 1.5 degrees goal alive. As expected, there were quite a few protests and demonstrations outside and inside the hall. Every day. Security almost. was very tight around the conference center, but the first weekend is when we saw the really big demonstrations with Greta Thunberg, very colorful, very musical, very often. Coming inside the conference center, yesterday there was a people's plenary, and this was like a takeover of the oh, whole yeah. event by civil society yeah. groups. And then they staged a symbolic walkout. It was a very powerful message. Um, they left the, the blue zone and then they met another group of protesters that were outside. And they stayed almost all day waiting for, for the resolution of the, of the conference. And there were many indigenous groups represented. Yes, uh, they have been very active during the whole two weeks. We have seen them in the negotiation rooms. We have seen them at the pavilions, uh, at the protests. They have been very vocal about uh, the protection of, of, of their land and how they can um, help and support the, the 1.5 goal because they're the actual experts when, in, when it comes to, to take care of nature and live in harmony with nature. For young activists, indigenous people, scientists and governments from around the world, the work now continues. And the Secretary General said it clearly, it starts now, keep pushing forward. The destination is COP27, taking place next year in Egypt. See you there.